I'm feeling super punctual today. Um, I've got a couple of formalities to get out of the way. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, welcome to this second day of the Crow Symposium. Um, before we get started, I really want to take a second to thank um, some folks. Thank the staff here at TLU, um, specifically Susan and Jonathan for helping out, um, without which this wouldn't have happened. Other folks who this would not have happened without is my um, compatriots on the committee. Um, Tiffany Sia, um, Dr. Sam Hajazi, Dr. Margaret Gonzalez, my unofficial chairperson of operations, Amelia Cofford. Um, I want to thank her. Kathleen Seals was a late addition, but a crucial member. Dr. Vroman, you all know, has enthusiasm for comics, couldn't be here today. And finally, um, our um, captain of our team, Dr. Bob Jonas, is going to introduce um, our next speaker. Thank you, Kyle. And I'd like to recognize Kyle Olson for all the work that he's done on this program putting everything together, so let's give him a big hand. I'd also like to announce everyone to turn off your cell phones, please. We don't want any interruptions. And if you do have to leave uh, after the first speaker, please do so quietly. Um, we don't want a lot of interruption between speakers today. So I've taught basic biology here at TLU since the course was instituted about 26 years ago. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been a, a great opportunity for me to talk science with students who are somehow turned off by it. Maybe they were told they weren't good at science, or that it wasn't cool, or maybe they just couldn't see themselves in science. But it's important for everyone to understand science-related issues that impact modern life, from climate change to gene editing technologies. Dr. Jay Hosler is reaching people through the superpower of creativity. Developing graphic novels that illustrate biological concepts, using disembodied brains, talking bees, ancient mythological creatures, and even Darwin himself. Dr. Hosler is a, is a fellow Mid Midwesterner who's very familiar with schools like TLU, having his undergraduate degree from DePaul University. He got his PhD from Notre Dame, followed by a postdoc at Ohio State University, he is professor and chair of biology at Juniata College, another small liberal arts college in Pennsylvania. So join me in welcoming Dr. Jay Hauser. Thank you for coming, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, anytime you are asked to be on the same bill as Scott McCloud, uh, you can feel like you've made it. Um, so, I, there are two words you never want associated with your comics or a talk that you're about to give because it affects crowd size. The first is all ages, all right? So I make all ages comics. I did not put that in there. The second word is science. Uh, and these, I put it in there twice, which was doubly bad for me, all right? Um, so today, what I'd like to do is at some level I'd like to make uh, a case for using comics in general. Um, you could think of it maybe as an applied example or set of examples for what Scott talked about last night. Um, and then I'll give you some more personal reflections on how I do it. Now, one of the things I'd like you to keep in mind is that as I'm talking about this, uh, my my intent is to express a personal journey, journey, I can't believe I said that, my colleagues would laugh if I said journey, um, a personal experience um, that I think can be applied to virtually any discipline. All right, so I am a liberal arts person, true and true. And so when I talk about science, that's my stuff, but I think that you can apply these principles to virtually anything. And I'll also make the argument that you don't have to be able to draw to do it, okay? Um, so what was, or what is a primary concern for mine? This is a relatively old graphic. Uh, the data has not changed uh, that much. So we live in a country where only about one in 20 people appreciate science, what it does, its significance. Um, our proficiency is fairly low. 
uh, in U.S. schools. My, my wife is a middle school teacher. She can attest to this, despite the fact her heroic efforts in math and science. And the National Science Board has said this once, they've said it again, and that is, man, we have got to figure out a way to explain to people why science is cool, right? We only have one Bill Nye. Uh, and so <clears throat> the question becomes, how do we do that? And, and this is particularly important, I think, in terms of when I'm talking to or talking as a scientist. Um, when you look at what a scientist does, and this is true of virtually any academic, but I'll speak for scientists because I can speak authoritatively about that. Our day-to-day -day is pretty damn boring. So why would you sit, why would I sit in a lab for six hours a day training honeybees to associate an odor with sucrose? Why would I do that? It, ha it can't be because I like being bored because I don't like being bored it almost certainly must mean that there is some underlying passion. And that's absolutely going to be the case with virtually anybody who dedicates their life to something. What we have not effectively done is shared that passion. And so this is my little way of doing it. Now, who cares? And Bob sort of alluded to why you should care, but who cares? Well, scientific hero number one, Carl Sagan. Um, we live in a society exquisitely dependent, I should read it like Carl Sagan, we live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology. We are making policy decisions right now. Do we teach evolution in schools? For the record, no other country is having this debate, all right, none. We are at the bottom. I think Turkey is having the debate and Syria. Well, So do we do that? Do, is global climate change real? Are climate patterns changing? Are storms getting worse? I don't know, Texas, you tell me, <laughs> right? Of course they are, but we have politicized these issues and we politicize them to the point that people don't even bother to educate themselves about it anymore because my party says this and this, I would argue, goes for both sides of the aisle. I've talked to people who are, I'm, I personally, ardently in favor of the notion that climate change is occurring. I have talked to people who are also ardently, that have no idea about the evidence, right? So this failure to educate ourselves is a real thing that spans across the aisle. So why do I do what I do? Here's, here's hero number two, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Spain's greatest scientist. And this is from a postage stamp that featured him, 1906 Nobel Prize. Father of modern neuroscience, his major contribution um, was demonstrating that the nervous system is made up of individual cells. Prior to that, the prevailing idea was that it was a network of tubes, fused cells, right? And Cajal did so as a histologist, effectively painting brains. He wanted to be an artist as a child. And it was cool that he got his art and his science to dovetail. Whoa, what an idea. I love it. Um, he says, to labor according to the inclinations of the, of the spirit is an incomparable pleasure and solace. So let me use that quote to set up why I do or why I'm interested in doing the things that I do. So what are the inclinations of my spirit? Okay. I'll break it down for you. Number one, I want you to know that the snot, that the uh, bone-eating snot flower worm exists in the world. Okay, so check. I have done that. I want you to care about the bone-eating snot flower worm. I want you to know that that bone-eating snot flower worm sits and grows and breaks down the bones of giant whales that die and draw, drift to the bottom of the ocean. This is where we find them. We're not really sure how they get from one carcass to the next, but they do. And they are big players in that element of returning that material back to the environment. And then I want to inspire you to go find out more about the bone-eating snot flower worm. Because now you know it's out there. 
maybe, just maybe, you read a little bit more about it. Maybe, maybe you're inspired by it artistically or from a metaphorical standpoint. I'm not sure what the metaphor would be, but it could be there, right? Those are my inclinations of spirits, or in other words, my objectives, right? I'll be a teacher for a second. That's my objective. What labor gives me incomparable pleasure in the pursuit of those objectives? Comics, duh, right? That's why I'm talking. Um, <clears throat> but it's important to understand that um, I could have done a whole bunch of different comics. When I was in college, I did college cartoons. I think I told this to the group last night. They were really trailblazing cartoons for the college newspaper in which I discussed um, really new topics like the bookstore is too expensive, um, it's hard to get a date, this class is hard, um, there's nothing to do here, right? And no one had ever tackled those topics before. Um, so I could have done that. I did a, um, a superhero parody called Cowboy about, so I'm from Indiana, from cow country, about a kid that gets bitten by a radioactive cow, gets cow powers, wears a battle udder. Um, <laughs> I just recently, a couple years ago, did two stories for the Adventure Time comic from Boom Comics. Despite seven books prior to that, this was the moment for my children where I made it. <laughs> where what dad did was real. Right? <clears throat> I could have done that. Uh, maybe not as a full-time gig, but you know, to satisfy that urge to create, I could have. But I don't. I make science comics. And so my question is, how can my can comics help me achieve those inclinations of my spirit? Right? Now, I'm going to go to the next slide. And when I do, I'm going to present to you one of the most cringe-worthy words I've ever discovered. Now, here's the thing. I'm hypercritical of words. It is cringe-worthy. And so the fact that I'm going to show it to you should suggest that, in my view, its merit far outweighs the cringeworthiness. This word describes what I'm trying to do. Wonderstanding, right? It's almost like stars should shoot off the screen and a rainbow goes sweeping through, right? And a unicorn, I'm writing. <laughs> Wonderstanding. But it's true. And the reason it's true is because scientific facts aren't enough when you're communicating. They are for me, don't get me wrong, I get a complimentary potential textbook, right, from a publisher for general biology, and I know what I'm doing over the weekend, right? I dig into the textbook because that's where my brain is. But I also know that as an academic, if we were to plot a normalized curve of interest in science and willingness to read the textbooks, that I'm at least two standard deviations removed from the middle. That technically makes me deviant, right? You are being taught by a bunch of deviants. And so we have to meet you where you are, right? I think comics can do that. This is a two-page spread from a book on evolution I did. This is the one book I've written that I didn't illustrate. It was illustrated by Xander Cannon and Kevin Cannon, not brothers, but good friends. And when I wrote the script for this, uh, this is in a chapter where we're sort of looking at the evolution of life. This is the Jurassic, Mesozoic period. And I said to them, um, okay, here's the tech, blah, 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 we're setting this up. Right-hand page, last panel, setting up the page turn, right? I said, the next, and I said, turn the page, and I said, draw dinosaurs here. And they email me like, uh, could we get a little more direction? I'm like, yeah, make me go, ah. Oh. And those moments have to exist in science comics. Those moments have to be there. When you turn the page and go, oh, look at those dinosaurs. <laughs> that little nine-year-old in you that liked dinosaurs or big monsters or Godzilla or whatever, it has to go, oh. because at some level, that little nine-year-old is still working away in every scientist who's laboring in a lab. Every time you get a result that's cool, whether it's positive or negative, but it pushes you in one direction or the next, that is a sense of wonder. And we have to figure out how to do that. And that was, this is an example of one of those attempts. 
So I probably will only use that word one more time, but I want it to be in your head so now you, you can't unhear it. Right? So the first thing to do, if you want one understanding, is you've got to tell a story. And this is not something we do particularly well, I say for scientists. Having been to a gajillion different talks, what we like to do is we like to show you how much work we've done. I don't think this is, and this is probably true of students too, I can say this of students. When students have done research, um, students in my uh, lab and other labs do research for two years for us, they've done a jillion experiments. Now most of them are just preliminary or control, right, and we're moving towards, they really have one or two graphs of data that tell the story, right? But man, you've done all that work, so what do you do up there in a presentation? We did this, and we did this, and we did this, and we did this, and it's almost like something you would expect a hypnotist to do, right? And you slowly, as an audience, drift into a deep sleep. Because it's boring. Because it's like watching a movie being made or hearing someone talk about a movie being made instead of watching the movie, right? I don't need to hear everything you did. I don't have to hear, and, 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 and. Tell me a story. And scientists, sometimes we get really hung up. Well, we have to be objective and uh, uh, narratives that creep in. Narratives are absolutely natural ways to explain things, okay? Um, why, DNA, Watson and Crick's paper, first column, it's one page, the first column is a little story. They start off, well, we've, we've got several theories so da -da 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 about DNA, but none of them make sense. Therefore, we looked at this, and we found this. That's a narrative, right? So it doesn't have to be ponies and metaphors. It can be just a well-structured story. Santiago Romanacal wanted, wanted to be an artist. He wanted to be a storyteller. He wrote uh, non-science explanatory fiction that he richly illustrated almost like a comic. I don't know. It's pretty cool. Uh, those were actually lost when he was in the military. But even his illustrations of the histology he did were richly, richly illustrated and sort of told a story. So one of the other contributions Cajal made was explaining how nerve cells grow, which we didn't really have a sense of at the time. So once upon a time there was a nerve cell. It was adorable. Look how cute it is. Round. You got one, it's a cyclops. If we go back to Scott's talk, that's, if you're looking for a face, it's just one eye. Um, but one day it started to grow. Oh, and it continued to grow. Didn't really know what was going on. Grow, and then it hit puberty. And things sprouted all over the place. And that was weird. But then it was all grown up, capable of telling stories, right? This, that's a comic to me, right? Because what am I looking at? I'm looking at a series of pictures captured over time, telling me the change in event. I'm seeing the life story of that cell. It's also permanent, right? I can, I can study any stage I want. I have control. It's not like a video. I don't have to rewind or anything. I can look at any point that I'm interested in or confused by, right? Uh, Gene Yang, uh, writer of American Born Chinese, calls that the permanence of comics. You're stuck on one point, you're stuck on B. What the hell's happening in B? You can just stare at B for a while. You got the control. Pretty profoundly useful. Tell a story. For me, I got to tell a story with pictures, right? Um, pictures are pretty important. I'd like any of you who are in a science class of any kind to find your textbook and tell me if it's picture free. Are there graphs? Graphs are pictures. Are there pictures of animals? Example pictures of a bacillus, et cetera, et cetera. They're full of pictures. Science is not ashamed of pictures. We need them. Darwin's tree, Cajal's drawings. These are all profoundly important. Feynman diagrams. Feynman arguably won the Nobel Prize because he visualized an interaction of particles in a very particular way. They have a profound influence on your ability to remember things. So here's a study. Um, which I find pretty cool. The um, ER physicians uh, would have people come in for a wound of some sort. Let's imagine it's a giant gash on your arm, all right? So 
I want you to empathize here. You have done something stupid, probably on the weekend, after a couple Pepsis, and you've got an enormous gash in your outer hull, and stuff is leaking out, right? For most humans, that is an imperative. I must do something about this. Right? So you go to the ER. In this particular case, the ER docs will, they dress the wound, et cetera, et cetera. And then they provided uh, two sets of instructions. One set of instructions was just the text you see there. Right? So this is what you do, take care of your wound. The other was this one, text and pictures. All right? And then several weeks later, uh, they contacted the people in the study and they asked them four questions about wound care, just four. All right, now presumably, giant gaping hole, oozing, 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 important, take care of it, right? These are the emotional context of the wound. What do we see? Uh, cartoons and text is on the left, text only, so almost everybody read the instructions. Um, if they had pictures, a fifth did not if they only had text. That's a lot of people, that's one of five, right? That's, I think that's a lot. Um, how many answered all four correctly? Almost half with the cartoons, only 6% without. And then adherence, much higher. If you supply these silly images, they remember it better, right? I don't know, that's pretty compelling. That's a pretty compelling argument for pictures. If you put them together, almost a magical thing happens. They start doing more together than they do alone. So this was uh, an educational study by my mayor and his group. And they provided students with summaries of lightning, of how lightning is done, and they had they had this summary with the pictures and a caption. Then they had just the pictures. Then they had just the captions, right? So those three groups. And not surprisingly, pictures and captions together did better. And they actually statistically did better than you would expect from an additive effect, right? That's weird. Here's the really weird thing about the study. Then they gave people this, students this, and then they wrote a block of text underneath. And when you gave them this and a block of text, do they do better or worse? They did worse. Because that block of text interfered. Right? I know. It's weird. They also, when these two things are together, do better on lateral questions. Questions that they didn't study. Right? They could think outside their normal box. That is pretty cool. Let's talk about comics a little bit. Scott mentioned closure, um, or what goes on between the panels. So here we have two panels. Wrinkles the Wonder Brain, right? Now what's he doing? Getting ready to jump? Consensus on that? How do you know he's not getting ready to take a poo-poo? Or, what's that? Oh, the next picture. But do we actually see him jump? Wait, because this picture, this could be him sliding backwards down an invisible slide. Because it's comics and we can do whatever we want. Right? Uh, but, but it's not. Your brain stitches them together in a very particular way and it says, look, he's clearly crouching and jumping. Right? That requires input from you. That requires activity. You're like, okay, who cares? Well, what's neat about that, what part of your body is active when it's connecting those squares? Liver? Stomach? And this is like one of those easy questions. You tell me when I get it right. Brain? Ah, oh, the brain! Neat! That's where learning happens. And, and it happens when you have nerve cells active. And it happens really, really quickly. Right? Now the argument for comics is that in fact you are sitting there stitching things together. So this is an experiment we did um, with an eye tracker. This is a device where I can show students um, 
four panel uh, comic, in this case, a uh, wordless comic with Charlie Brown, and then we can watch where their eyes go. So here's Charlie Brown walking with um, a spaceman hat. He's walking, he sees something. Snoopy walks by with another spaceman hat. Charlie Brown kicked, why did Charlie Brown kick his spaceman hat? How about a hand? Anybody want to take a shot at it in front of a large group of people? We won't laugh at you. Yep? Snoopy is better. It's better! Oh, poor Charlie Brown. He never has a big antenna. Um, so do we actually interact with this way in which we stitch these panels together? Well, if you watch this person, this is pretty typical. Uh, it's unusual that they started at the second panel, but whatever. Um, they're looking. Here we've got nine seconds. And they look at panel two for a little bit. And they look about panel three, and then they hop to here. And they're like, what in the hell just happened? So they pop back here. Look, look, look. Pop back here. Look, 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 look. And when you look in this particular situation at how much time the viewer spends in each panel, it's pretty low in one and two, pretty high in three and four because they're working it out. And they work it out fairly quickly, in 10 seconds. Um, we, had, we did have one student who had never read comics before and could not figure it out. So you're supposed to say, when you get the joke, you know, stop. And it took them five minutes and we had to, they were like, did you get it yet? No. All right, so, so it doesn't work for everybody. New connections, uh, memories, etc., are activity dependent. Right? When your nerves are active, they're forming synapses. So here is an experiment from Zoo et al. Right? It's, they're watching a nerve in real time, which is pretty phenomenal technology in a live organism. And they've got this little mouse, and it's learning how to reach this seed. Right? So that's the task it's, it's facing. It's learning how to get to it through, through the cage. And I'm going to use the laser pointer. This is the nerve cell that they're looking at. And what you can see here is that, oh, here's a little extension that pops up. There it is, and it stabilizes. Here are some, oh, this one goes away, pruned. All right, so when you learn things, you actually build connections and you actually prune connections you're not using. So at, through that activity, these little spines start popping off the dendrites to make connections. It's pretty exciting. And I, I hasten to point out, dendritic spines, prior to Cajal, people thought they were an artifact of histology. And Cajal was the first to demonstrate that, no, they're real. Not only real, but as we now know, extraordinarily important. And then comics, and putting words and pictures together, can have an emergent property. They can do, as I said, more than you would anticipate them doing alone. So this is a maybe my favorite panel, because you know we all have those things that we do we think are very clever, which may not be as clever to other people, but humor me. Um, this is from a book called The Sandwalk Adventures, and it's the story of a conversation that Charles Darwin has with a follicle mite living in his left eyebrow, right? And uh, I'm not going to tell you more, because I'm hoping that'll inspire you to go pick it up. Uh, and in it, he's explaining his theory to the follicomites. Follicomites live in his body. Um, we all have follicomites. About 80% of the population in North America has them. They don't really hurt you. They might be associated with pimples, so you can blame them. Um, but that's about it. And the mites think that Darwin is their god. And he's explaining his theory of evolution to them. Now, this particular panel, uh, the sort of displays, does this seem, these series of images seem recognizable to you? Anyone know what this is typically referred to as? Evolution, the march of progress, right? Breaking ape, right? Standing up until he can finally use a laptop and a smartphone, right? But we know that that's not an accurate icon of evolution, because it suggests a directionality, me. Right? I am the pinnacle. You can make the same claim if you want, but we know it's not true. It's me. Right? Um, <clears throat> as he's doing so, he's, he's actually explaining why this is not true. The point is, you're thinking about this all wrong. Evolution is not a nice, neat, progressive march. There's no predictable destination. It's a process of surviving unpredictable events often in unpredictable ways. 
So it becomes this way, hopefully, of subtly deconstructing this particular image. So when you do science comics, science comic explanations, or explanations, frankly, of any discipline. So if you're a, my mom was a sociologist. So if you're a sociologist and you want to talk about something, boom. I, I called her a sociologist. She was a social worker, her sociology major. Um, if you want to do something about poverty, I think this applies. When you do these explanations in comic form, there are certain downsides. Okay? Absolutely. You, they, they take longer to do. Okay, so they're going to be longer, especially if you're weaving in a story of some sort, even if it's a slight one. There's going to be less content. You can't say everything you want to say. Too bad. What you have to do is figure out what's important. Right? And there's a stigma in the United States, right? It's going away, but they're comics. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a, a study we did um, in large part because there is a stigma associated with comics. So those are downsides. What are, the, what are the benefits? Stories give you context, right? Who likes memorizing lists of disconnected facts? It's a rhetorical question. Who likes learning about stuff um, that makes sense? So I had a professor as an undergraduate, John Dittmer. He was, he was one of the Freedom Riders. He was down in Selma. And he would come to the lectern, right? And he would grab that lectern. Oh my God, I can still remember it. And he had this voice like this. And he held forth. I mean, it, we would probably argue, well, it's not good pedagogy. You're standing at the podium. And oh my Lord, I was transfixed. Um, I, that's how I figured out how to write and not look at my notes at the same time. Right? And I learned so much from that course. Because every day, he came in and he told me a story. Oh, I love it when people tell me stories. He provided context. So all those names, snicked. I mean, and any historical thing, for example, I'm sure Don is going to talk about this later, it has lots of names and lots of dates and lots of places. And how does it all make sense if you don't make sense for them? Right? Provide the context. And that leads to coherence. It also allows you to set up relationships, potentially causality. And second time, well, understanding. Excellent. All right. So a uh, set of experiments we did. I'm going to look at my clock here. Whoa. All right. Um, comics and science literacy. This is what I'm sort of interested in. So here's my story. Once upon a time, there was a scientist. And she knew a lot of stuff. It was all swirling around her head. And there were students. The students. They wanted access to that information, right? But it appeared as if there was a great chasm between the student and the teacher. They knew so much. Now, as it turns out, there were some students who could reach the teacher, reach that place through conventional means. Deviant students who liked textbooks. <laughs> People who actually wore bow ties, <laughs> right? And for them, access to the information was relatively straightforward for whatever reason. Their wiring, their upbringing, their inclinations of their spirit, right? They could get there. But there were others, more, in fact, for which that wasn't quite the easy route. And for them, there was a second chasm between them and the primary means with which the information was conveyed. What about them? They vote. Understand that in the United States, um, if we don't address climate change, it is not the politician's fault. It's yours. If you don't vote, if you don't understand the way things work, it is yours. This is a democracy. 50% you know, of people don't go out and vote. So uh, if we get slobber knockered, it's on us. They need to know and understand this just like everybody else. How do we get there? Ah, possible strategy. 
maybe we can stretch a big trampoline of comics between where they are and the more traditional vehicles. Because at some point, you do have to sort of dive into something that's potentially more complicated. But can we dip their toes in the river sticks? Give them a little bit of confidence. So our hypothesis was, if we use this visual way of storytelling, delivering scientific information, can we provide context that will enhance formal and, I think even more importantly, informal learning? Will you be interested enough outside of class or outside of a normal formal educational situation to find answers for yourself, to poke around? So I made this comic book textbook called Optical Illusions. It was funded by the National Science Foundation, which that was just about the biggest charge ever. Um, and what it does is follows Wrinkles the Wonder Brain through a series of eye-related adventures. I know. I've got you hooked already, don't I? And each little story is interleaved with more traditional text. So the, the, the idea was I would introduce a story, a concept in the story, and then I would expand upon it in a more, um, more traditional way, just to practice that transition back and forth. So what we did was we um, gave students, we'll use this, a pretest. What was your attitude about biology? What was your attitude about content? Or did you understand some of the content? What was your attitude about comics? And universally, for non-science kids, these were all low. Biology is icky. I don't understand any of these questions. And comics are for dumb people. That was the overwhelming consensus of students. Not hoity-toity academics, but students. That comics are not for serious people. So then what we did was I taught with it, had other people teach with it, used the book. Two weeks after finishing using the book, we all gave the same exact assessments, right? This is what you do with a pre and post test. We gave them the attitude, content, comics. Oh, as the picture and facial expressions indicate, <laughs> that is insane joy. Perhaps those are the investigators. Um, um, biology attitudes were significantly higher, improved, right? Um, it was no longer as terrifying or awful. Uh, their content knowledge went from failing to about B minus, all right? And their comics attitudes also improved. And it seems like there's a, a correlation between the two when you look at the two. But that content embedded in the comics may, in fact, work. <clears throat> So that's settled. <laughs> that one paper, that one anecdotal device, that one bit of data settles it all. In fact, there's actually a growing body of literature from several uh, researchers, from Siegel and a number of other people, um, from Mayer, to indicate that this is a terrific way, a terrific avenue through which we can teach. Is it the only one? Is it going to replace textbooks? No, don't be silly. It's not going to replace movies. It's something new, additional, right? A new arrow in your quiver if you're an instructor. <clears throat> OK, good. So let's assume, though, that for the most part, we don't have to really convince ourselves that words and pictures are good for learning. All right? We do have to show that. Uh, but let's assume that we've got it pretty close to settled. So let's talk about um, my science comics, keeping in mind uh, I think this can be applied to, to, to virtually any discipline. I have one guiding philosophy when I'm making science comics. Don't make science comics. Don't make science comics. All right? Don't make peop what people think are science comics. Um, <clears throat> when uh, my book Evolution came out, there was a blogger named The Confessions of a Science Librarian who really sort of reviewed it and sort of captured my sense of things or what I was feeling. And it was this, he said, I don't know much about um, science comics, science graphic novels. I do know from my little bit of experience, he said, that they seem to fall into two categories. One takes a densely written, richly illustrated, or densely written textbook and creates a densely written, richly illustrated textbook. 
right? That's one way to do it. Which, frankly, I can't get through those graphic novels. Right? So it's not that the medium is perfect and I'll read anything. I can't. They're boring. Or you can make use of the medium. You can let the pictures do some of the work. You can tell a story. You can cut down some of the content and provide these contextualizing cues. I was glad that he placed my book in the second category. <clears throat> the first and most important thing is to tell a story. So my first book was a graphic novel about honeybees called Clan Apis. And this quote appears uh, in that graphic novel on the front, front pieces. And captures what I've already sort of said a little bit. We cannot win the battle to save species and environments without forging an emotional bond between ourselves and nature as well, for we will not fight to save what we do not love. That is absolutely true. You don't like this planet, you don't love this place, you don't love where you live, then it is not important to you. Right? Why does a science do, scientist do what the scientist does? Because they love it. Why do I work with bees? I love bees. I don't know why. Inclinations of the spirit. Right? But I do. My job is to explain to you why you should care. Why maybe you don't fall in love with a bee. Uh, maybe you're not like, you're not frenemies anymore. Right? You pollinate my food, but let's not hang. Right? And maybe just a little bit, kind of like them a little bit. And I'm not, I'm not asking for much. But really seriously, if you don't care about something, why would you do anything for it? All right? And a textbook doesn't necessarily, unless you're deviant, make you care about something. Stories do. <clears throat> the way in which I try to do this personally um, is through something that I was already doing, but um, a young adult librarian in Boston once told me she saw in here, and I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, that's true. It's the, eye of the, the idea of the mirror and the window. All right, the first is every story has to have a mirror to it, right? You have to show the reader, oh, look, this is kind of like you, right? You can relate to this. So you got honeybees. Honeybees live in a big family, lots of people. Guess what? They live, they're born, they grow up, they die, right? They have a family. If you get too many in a hive, they get on each other's nerves and they split, right? There's romance, right? The queen goes out on her maiden voyage. Her virgin flight mates with 17 other males. Those guys die because their penises explode when they have sex, so they fall to the ground, right? I mean, and she goes home and she's got this delightful package of male gametes, right? And then she uses that package for up to four years to fertilize her eggs. That is a heck of a story. And I'm really glad, whenever I teach entomology and we get to the hymenoptera and we talk about exploding penises, I probably say it six or seven times. And usually at the end of that, when we move on to the next phyla, the guys in the classroom all say, it's just as long as you don't say exploding penis anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I'm like, okay. Um, this is one of four pages that appeared in um, Ask Magazine recently uh, about how to make a queen. And I show it because my son Max colored it. He's a high school senior. Uh, so this is his first published work, good for him. And then the window. And I alluded it to it just a second ago. Um, you have to not only say, look, look, this is like you, but you also have to show me a window into a world I don't know. Right, this, is, this is why science fiction works so well. What's this window? OK, well, let's talk about bees, which we take for granted. We see specials on them. We all know they're dying. That all breaks our heart. But I want you to think about what it means, to, how weird being a bee is. So <clears throat> they live on wax honeycombs, right? Where does that wax come from? Anybody know? What's that? Well, they mold it with their saliva, but where do they get the wax? They secrete it out of plates underneath their belly. So I want you to imagine, most of you probably aren't married right now, but you might be one day. You find that certain special somebody, you tie the knot, and you say, let's settle down, honey. 
and he or she looks at you and says, okay, let's make a house. And you start digging in your ear and you start saving up. Because why? Because you're a bee and you live in a house built from your own bodily secretions. <laughs> that is a different world, right? <clears throat> Depending upon the size of the cell that an egg lay, you're laid in, your crib, where you grow literally as a baby. If it's the small one, you grow up as a girl. If it's a bigger one, you grow up as a boy. And if it's a really big one, you're the queen. Right? So imagine if your crib, now, that size thing tells the queen if it's small, she lays a fertilized egg. If it's bigger, she lays an unfertilized egg. That makes a male. And if it's really big, then the workers feed her different stuff. But imagine if your crib was the determining factor of your gender. That's nuts. All right? So it's, a, it's showing you a different world. And there's where we get the wonder. All right? So um, here is a two-page story. This was actually, I was contacted by a researcher who wanted, who's publishing in PLOS One. She's like, I want to have a comic with my paper as like a comic press release. Would you do this? I'm like, are you kidding? That's awesome. So this is a paper. Um, it is about um, gene expression and gustatory receptors on these butterflies. They have big, fluffy front arms. I'm going to read it to you, okay? I'm going to try to do the voices. Um, Stacy, I've been looking all over for you. Are you avoiding me? It's over, Travis. We've made it. I don't really need you anymore. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't need me anymore for what? Well, right now I'm looking for a host plant to lay our eggs on. Pfft, I can totally help with that. Oh, yeah? Well, what do you think of this one? It's nice. I like the green. It's planty. Uh, this plant is full of cyanogenic glycosides that would kill our larvae. Is that like on a label somewhere? No, Travis, it's not labeled. I can taste the bitter toxins in my feet. Oh, please. It's true. Don't you ever wonder why my four legs are all full of brushy taste receptors and yours aren't? I just figured you'd like to accessorize. <sighs> Look, Travis, it's not you, it's me. Evolution has exerted more selective pressure on the taste receptors of females, heliconus butterflies, than males. Over time, females have evolved a deep, meaningful co-evolutionary co relationship with our host plant. A close examination of the taste receptor genes in my genome has revealed a wide variety of general modifications that you males just don't have. Yeah? Well, uh, picking host plants is stupid. Don't be bitter. I'm not bitter! Yes, you are. I could taste it. <laughs> So what's the, what's, the, what's the mirror there? What's that? A relationship. All of us have had a relationship at some level. We've been frustrated, unable to communicate, or just not necessary anymore. Uh, what's the window? What's that? All the facts. What are the facts? Right, so a female butterfly can go around and touch things and decide whether it's a good place to lay her eggs. That is pretty darn cool. So I've said I want this, in theory, to apply to any discipline, right? That you can apply the mirror and window anything. And you're going to tell me, like my kids in comics and culture, a gen ed class that I teach, that I can't draw. And I'm going to say, if you can hold a pencil, you can draw, right? This, arguably one of the most popular web comics out there, XKCD. Now the guy can draw, right? Randall Monroe can draw. He can draw spaceships and really cool other images, but traditionally, what does he do? He draws stick figures. Oh, well, look at this. I love this, this particular comic. right? And what is he doing? He's capturing a lot of the important aspects that we have to think about. And he's doing so visually. He's got a spectrum, sociologists at one end, psychologists saying uh, sociology is just applied psychology, and the, and the biologists saying psychology is just applied biology, biology is just applied chemistry, and the physicist, of course, says, which is just applied physics, it's nice to be on top. And then visually we see this huge gap. And at the other end is the mathematician. Say, hey, I didn't see you over there. That's adorable, right? That is an effectively written and drawn cartoon. It gets at 
a really important idea in the relationships of science, and it does so with really simple images that are funny. A stick figure biologist holding a squid, right? That's hilarious. And then just that casual wave from the mathematician. These are images from comic stories that I've had students do about their majors. I use these two because both of these two people didn't tell me once they couldn't draw, they told me twice they could not draw. And I keep a record, if you say it twice, I'm gonna use your pictures in, so I have others, I have a catalog of the twice I can't draws. I think they can draw, and I think they do amazing things. My, one of my favorites, the one we still talk about in class, is a uh, psychology major talking about refuting Freud, right? And the last panel, the knowledge punch. <laughs> I didn't suggest that to her. That was all her. How could someone who can't draw and tell a story do something that clever? How is that possible? It was probably possible because I made them and that they had the capacity, right? So we'll finish with Carl since we started with Carl. Uh, you have something that you are willing to work hard at. You have something that you do that doesn't make you bored, that maybe other people think is weird, right? But you have access to things that we like to know. We just don't want to see you do it, right? Something somewhere incredible is waiting to be known. And we're only going to know it if you tell us. All right? Thank you very much. <clears throat> So I don't know what the time schedule is. We have time for questions, unless people have to dart to class. OK, yeah. I'll take questions. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to phrase it. But, well, I, I think I can. So like, you know, we talk a lot about like, science fiction and topics. It seems like a lot of the science has been taken out, and so it's more like science fantasy. Like, right. Do you know, like, Kind of like current works that are kind of reinforcing science in kind of like inner genre. Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is, um, a lot of the science has been bled out of science fiction, so that it's really becoming science fantasy, right? And are there works that that I think are particularly good? I'll tell you a sort of a yes/no answer. Uh, so there was a recent reboot of Battlestar Galactica series, and I got hooked on it because it seemed real hard science-y. And it was hard science for the entire series until the last hour of the two-hour finale when it became magic. Uh, and so I say that because I thought it was really good, really good up to that point. And I don't know that they didn't have the confidence to finish it off in a certain way, but um, so yes, there are things doing it in, in terms of, you know, science comics. You know, honestly, nothing that I have read or had on my radar. Um, it's it's it typically is a little bitty thing. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, I can always tell. So when I write a story. Uh, the science is first, and the story is built around that. Um, you can tell stories, you can tell when they make a story that is the story, and we're gonna throw some science in, right? So for example, A Bug's Life, right? Um, Flick walks into that bar. Remember this scene? Walks into a bar, he's looking for it. And I, I like this movie because A, it's about bugs, and B, it's, uh, it's what, a carbon copy of the Magnificent Seven, which is a carbon copy of the Superior Seven Samurai. Um, and at some point, this mosquito sallies up to the bar. And the guy goes, give me some B positive, or something like that, right? And we go, ah, ha, ha, mosquitoes drink blood. And, and that one sticks out to me because I sit there and I go, wow, they really missed an opportunity for something I think would be funnier, which is males don't drink blood. The male mosquito does not drink blood, 
right? Mother takes the blood. And isn't it so much funnier if it was like a Phyllis Diller voice coming up to the bar? Give me some people! I don't know why that is profoundly funnier than some lush guy, right? But there was a situation where they knew a little bit of science and they were going to chuck it in because it's about bugs and who's really going to care, right? And so it does feel like there's this sort of trend toward um, science as an accessory. You know what I mean? Science as an accessory, science as uh, an accoutrement that lends an air of validity to something. But um, I think it goes back to not knowing the science and sort of being able to, because it's different when you're a futurist, right? You say, well, this is the science and this is what we think we'll know. And can we spin something really cool out of that? Um, so it's kind of, it's not a very gratifying answer. I wish I had, I wish I had an example to say, read Jay Hosser's book. They're great. We're right up in that alley. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Right, so um, this to me, um, this to me, well, number one, what we know is that ELA, so English is a second language, they use comics heavily, right? Because comics provide context cues, they provide permanence, they provide all these different things that help readers who are either A, going from one language to the other, or frankly, if you're going from no language to a language, right, this is why we give kids picture books. A is for apple, okay, there's an A and there's the word apple, oh, and there's a picture of an apple. Um, when you want fluency, so one of the reasons, let me say it like this, one of the reasons I think it's important to tell stories with science is because you never learn something the first time. You have to revisit it, you have to read it again, right? Well, I can tell you that the comics in my collection are well-worn because I've read them a gajillion times, right? So how do you get a kid to reread something? And if you give them a comic and they're working on fluency, well, they're going to reread it. And every time they reread it, they're going to make those contact cues and those connections. And assuming that, you know, it's not barbarously written, right, that they're actually complete sentences with verbs and nouns, how is that not creating liter uh, fluency, right? That's, I guess that would be my response. Other questions? It's just about go time for Don. Oh, you have one, okay. Well, I was asking, are you, are you leaving right away? Yes, unfortunately my flight is out of Austin and I've got to leave right after this. I don't even get to stay for Don. I know, it's a bummer. But you can find me online if you write jayosso.com and there's an email address through there. So if you have questions or anything like that under the contact tab at the top of the page. All right? Okay, I think my time's up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Prepared for the symposium, so watch for that. It'll be probably mid February. None of the speakers has required that we pin down a date yet, so uh, that's still up in the air. Thanks. On a more technical note, if you were here for the first lecture and you're staying for the second lecture and you need to make sure a professor knows that you are here, you need credit for being here, you will need to go out and re-swipe your card. We got a couple minutes. If you want to go do that now, get up now so you're not interrupting the next speaker. Go swipe that card, get that extra credit. You need those points. Some of the students who had been here before passed, they were like, Why is this fiber? And I'm like, I didn't get credit. Like, it's different now. And apparently, they didn't have as many people letting people know what was going on with that. So, uh, give them 
hold a second to get back in here. Don is still up there trying to figure his stuff out because he's almost done. And then they'll come back in and I can introduce you real quick. Do you want an introduction? Do you want to wing it? You can introduce you. Whatever you want. Oh. Whatever or I could just decide when you just I decide. have enough people here. Yeah. yeah, I can do that. Cool. I think the card swipers are wandering back in. So, good morning. My name is Amelia Coford, and I'm a librarian here at TLU. I'm part of this year's Crow Symposium Planning Committee, and we're so glad we were able to bring Don Lohman. Don is a senior lecturer of queer studies at the University of Bonn in Germany. He researches and teaches about queer theory, gender, race, and ethnicity, and cultural and regional studies of North America and Scotland. He often designs courses that incorporate international field trips so his students can investigate cultures and history firsthand. He also works with poverty and youth homelessness through both research and social action, and he's on the ambassador board for New Avenues for Youth. He has a master's in business administration and another master's in intercultural communication. He has lived in Florida, France, South Korea, and now divides of time between Germany, Portland, Oregon, and Bosnia and Croatia. But this audience will be happy to know that he spent the first 12 years of his life in Texas. In case you need any more evidence that he's a well-rounded and multi-talented person, he's also on the German national team for Ultimate Frisbee. Yeah. Please welcome Don Lohmann. Green arrow to go forward. Mm -hmm. Once I get up there and switch sides. Oh, okay. And red to go back. Um, laser is that, and it is blinding. Okay. So, so watch out. All right. So, am I on now? Can you hear me now? Okay. I think I was waiting for him to run back up there. You, you can hear me now? Okay. So, some technical difficulties, the whole problem of me being an evil Mac user. Um, so I'm gonna refer and kind of have to run over into my corner every now and then because I have completely memorized. Okay. I'll just be loud, oh, there, there we go. Okay, so I, I work in a palace, which is kind of cool. This is more just a slide to, uh, hold the time before I go to my first official slide. Um, so, my topic today, what I picked, uh, the new superheroes, minority representation, comics as an educational tool. Kind of a long-winded title there. Um, and I picked some comics that I really enjoy. Uh, Fun Home, Miss Marvel, Black Panther, 